part of society. Our first two speakers are Professor Mary Malvi Roberts and Dr. Charlotte Croft. Professor Malvi Roberts teaches English literature at the University of the West England, Bristol. Professor Malvi Roberts is an internationally acclaimed scholar who is the recipient of several accolades and the author of several books. She has published extensively on a variety of topics, which include volumes and articles on Angela Carter. She is also the co-founder of the Angela Carter Society. Dr. Charlotte Crofts is Associate Professor in Filmmaking at the University of the West of England, Bristol. And together with Professor Malvi Roberts, uh, she sits on the Executive Committee of the Angela Carter Society. With Professor Malvi Roberts, Dr. Crofts has co-edited a recently published, published volume entitled Angela Carter's um, Pyrotechnics, a Union of Contraries. Uh, uh, this book has been published in uh, 2022. So the title of the paper, yes, that's the <laughs> cover. <laughs> the title of the paper uh, is Angela Carter's Place Making, Memorializing an Iconoclast. Thank you. So, I think Marie's going to play um, her recording first. So we've just sent you the link in the chat. So I'm not sure if you're going to play it in the room. Yeah, let's um, try. But do, do you want to say any words before it plays, Marie? Um, no, just to hope it'll it'll work. <laughs> OK, and then I'll jump on after that. Yeah. So I'm going to share it through our screen. Is that correct? I think so. That would be great. That's absolutely fine. Um, sorry, I'm just trying. There we go. Does yeah. that work? Yeah. All right, and then I press play. I can't hear the, the audio. That's fine. Sorry, I forgot to press an important button <laughs> where I included the audio. <laughs> sorry, everyone. Okay. Yeah, could you put it back to the beginning? Yes. Yeah. Okay, thank you. For this 30th anniversary of the death of Angela Carter, I'm going to go back to her 25th anniversary and to the exhibition that I co-curated at the Royal West of England Academy in Bristol. It was called Strange Worlds, The Vision of Angela Carter. And I also want to raise the ghosts of the artworks that never made it to the show. The exhibition was one of many memorialising activities we carry out to raise awareness of the importance of Bristol to Carter's life and work. These are archived in a website which Charlotte and I built and currently curate called getangelacarter.com. It focuses on her links to the city where she lived and worked for most of the 1960s. After leaving in 1969, Carter reinvented herself through her writing and, her, and in her life. Most notably, I think, by abandoning her love of folk singing, a passion nurtured in Bristol with her first husband, Paul Carter. Though she left him and Bristol far behind, it's somewhat ironic that when she did remarry, it was to a Bristolian. In claiming or rather reclaiming Carter as a Bristol or West Country writer, I asked myself, is this contrary to how she might have wanted to be remembered? Have I the right to brand her as such? And secondly, with these anniversaries in mind, how do you commemorate an iconoclast? In the infernal desire machines of Dr. Hoffman, her narrator Desiderio makes a scathing comment about the act of reading about yourself in history books as becoming, I quote, posterity's prostitute, unquote. He also refers to statuary as a kind of whoredom. One can only imagine Carter's glee had she been around to see the toppling of the Colston statue in the centre of Bristol. 
with which she would have been familiar. And of course he became notorious because of his involvement in the slave trade. After being dumped in the River Avon, it has now been rehomed in the M Shed or People's Museum in Bristol. And it was there that I first took, or sorry, my second uh, venue um, for the um, exhibition. And that was after trying to persuade the Bristol Museum to house the exhibition. Um, this, because it was the setting for the first of Carter's Bristol trilogy, Shadow Dance. But they weren't keen, which is why I went to the RWA and I'm very glad I did. But what would Carter have felt about being commemorated in a museum? There's an iconoclastic scene in her novel, The Passion of New Eve, concerning waxworks of movie stars, including Jean Harlow, Marilyn Monroe, James Dean and Sharon Tate. And they're in a hall of the immortals, laid out in coffins with candles like religious icons. Their dismemberment by cult leader Zero and his followers amounts to a desecration of the sacred cult of the movie star. And the episode is a replay of the real life Charles Manson murders carried out by his cult followers, whose most notable, notable victim was Sharon Tate, the movie starlet wife of film director Roman Polanski. The novel's fictitious movie star Tristessa is a projected illusion of darkness and light. And this is as ephemeral as his, her identity, which to quote Carter, lies in having no ontological status, only an iconographic one. And it is the iconographic which is under attack here, the death of the symbol. Iconography is associated with art. And earlier in the novel, part of Evelyn's female indoctrination as he undergoes involuntary gender assignment from male to female is to be exposed to works of art. I quote, three video tale sequences of reproductions of every single virgin and child that had ever been painted in the entire history of Western European art and blown up to larger than life size accompanied by a soundtrack composed of the gurgling of babies and the murmurings of contented mothers." Unquote. Now this resembles a blueprint for the film Carter made later called The Holy Family Album. It was broadcast on British television in 1991 and it was very controversial. And in turn, this became the inspiration for the exhibition. But my idea did not emanate directly from Carter's film, rather from Charlotte Croft's book, which contains the most detailed account of how Carter narrates her own blasphemous version of the life of Christ through religious painting. And I was determined to secure some of these originals um, for the exhibition. For example, here are two paintings housed in the chapel-like setting of a side gallery of the RWA. There were indeed many outstanding artworks in the exhibition. And to give you an idea of the scale of, of this installation, um, you can see my head there um, amongst these gigantic figures. But the ones that got away populate an invisible catalogue in my head. So here is a sample of the ones that were never made it to the show. When it came to exhibiting artifacts, my biggest coup was to have borrowed Carter's very own fountain pen, which her husband Mark allowed me to hold. And I must confess, it felt like cradling a holy relic. And I felt a bolt of lightning run through me an artifact which I'd been unable to procure, which might surprise you, was a leg. And incidentally, amongst the various body parts from the dismembered waxworks in The Passion of New Eve is a wooden leg belonging to the one-legged Zero. 
but the leg I had my eye on was this one. It's a, the prosthetic limb once belonging to Frida Kahlo, an artist whom Carter greatly admired. And she wrote an essay about her to accompany a postcard set of, re of reproductions of her paintings, which I failed to get the go ahead to exhibit um, at the exhibition. By attaching a piece of highly decorative Mexican folk art in the form of an artificial leg to her own body, this further demonstrates how Carlo had turned herself into a piece of art, fused to the iconographic that she could set literally in motion. The final example on my wish list was for another body part, only this time a piece of human skin. This was to display Irezumi, the Japanese art of tattooing, on a grisly canvas which had most probably originated as a family heirloom, being a highly prized work of art. Irizumi fascinated Carter and is discussed in her non-fiction, and it's also integral to her description of the centaurs in the infernal design machines of Dr. Hoffman. Now, because this morbid artifact might have jeopardized prospective school visits, we had a far more suitable sub substitute in the form of the woodcuts by Carter's illustrator and friend, Corinna Sargood, which are the frontispieces to her two Virago books of fairy tales. And you can see one in a copy of my signed edition of the Virago book of fairy tales. I secured this trophy at the Cheltenham Literary Festival, where Carter was giving a reading from the book. And I line, I'd now like to imagine that she was using that very same fountain pen uh, for the inscription um, that I'd had displayed at the exhibition. While she was signing, I decided to grab the opportunity to invite her to come and give a talk to my students in Bristol. But I was very taken aback by her reaction, which was horrified and incredulous as she exclaimed, go to Bristol, Bristol, as if ricocheting a bullet, which I'd fired at her in all innocence. So in conclusion, we can only wonder how she might have felt about being brought back posthumously to Bristol in various multimedia incarnations, a city which she had left so decisively behind. And whether she would have approved of being the object there of that most traditional of all civic memorials, the commemorative plaque. Although Charlotte and I approached the Carter estate with a suggestion for a plaque on her Bristol home in the wake of the exhibition and accompanying conference we organized in the city, it was not until several years later that the initiative was revisited by the Clifton and Hotwell's Improvement Society, with the result that a plaque is now emblazoned on the Carter's former flat at 38 Royal York Crescent in Clifton, Bristol. It will be unveiled later this month on the 26th of March and through our Carter websites, <coughs> the Angela Carter Society will announce this Bristol commemoration to mark the 30th anniversary of her death. Thanks, I'll just stop sharing that if that's okay. Should we go straight into mine? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, that'd be great. Oh, goodness. Um, it's disappeared. Am I sharing something with you yet? Yeah, we can see um, we can see the program and I think we can probably see your desktop. Right. My PowerPoint. It's not a PowerPoint. My thing is just closed. Um, bear with me. I don't know what's happened to it. Don't look at my desktop. Not too many things open. Let me just stop sharing and then start again. Everybody close their eyes here. Yeah, I don't know why that wasn't letting me do it. Um, no, it's making the screen disappear. We saw it briefly just then. Yeah, but it's just disappeared. Bear with me. I'll try a different tactic. Where's it gone? 
Are you so ready? No. Oh. Uh, it's just closed the window. Let me just get it back. And try and share it via a different route. I'll just stop doing that for a minute. Can you see this? Yes. Can you see that? OK, all right. Sorry about that technical hitch. Um, so it's the second half and I'm not going to speak as slowly as Marie. So hopefully you can listen to the recording and slow it down. So there's quite a lot that I want to say, but I'll try and be clear um, and just interrupt me if I if I'm going too fast. Um, so this this presentation, this joint presentation stems out of a chapter that we're going to write for the very exciting new um, set of books on Angela Carter be, to be published by Bloomsbury, um, Angela Carter Pasts and Futures. And it comes from the impetus of kind of um, that tension between that uh, Marie just identified between our kind of urge to memorialise Carter and to make connections um, between Carter and Bristol and her as an iconoclast and um, not really believing in sort of memorialising people. And of course, when she died, she did become, um, you know, she was celebrated um, and the very famous obituary by Salman Rushdie um, does recognise her kind of um, iconoclasm. Um, Angela Carter was a thumber of noses, a defiler of sacred cows. She loved nothing so much as the cussed, but also the blithe nonconformity. Her books unsha uh, unshackle us. So we've got this idea, you know, this recognition of her as an iconoclast. But ironically, that obituary um, uh, formed part of a, a kind of um, ossification of Angela Carter as the white witch of English literature. This kind of a trope that's gathered around her. Um, and so ironically even though uh, Rushdie recognizes her as an iconoclast he has um, slightly sanitized her and made her into this figure um, that is more contained than perhaps she she should be um, so what I'm going to be doing is talking about that in the context of um, particularly how Angela Carter talks about statuary um, and then relate that back to the things that Marie was saying um, and I take this quotation this oft used quotation um, I feel free to loot and rummage in the official past, specifically a literary past, but I like painting and sculptures and the movies and folklore and heresies too. And just highlighting the word sculptures there. Um, and so I'm just going to start by talking about love. Um, and in love, Annabelle compares Lee to, to Canova's statue of Napoleon as a peacemaker. So on page 30, she talks about the technical pleasure she takes in observing his musculature. And she says he's quite, he was colourful to look at and also reminded her. And he, she specifically references this specific statue, which you can see in the bottom there looking rather marvellous. So I just, you know, when I originally read that and I wasn't interested in statues, I, I didn't follow that up. But having explored that in more detail, it's absolutely fascinating what this figure represents. So this is a statue. It's Napoleon as Mars, the peacemaker. Um, it's over 11 feet tall, if you include the staff. And it depicts the head of Napoleon on the body of Mars, the Roman god of war. And in his hand, you can see there's a detail there. He's clutching um, Nike, the winged victory, in his outstretched hand. And we all uh, will be thinking of the reference to um, the winged victory in Knights of the Circus. Um, and also the way in which Carter uh, looks at women as living statues and kind of explodes that trope in her writing. Um, so going back to the statue, obviously, um, you know, it, it's coming from uh, the Napoleonic regime where this kind of um, language of the Roman um, and kind of empire and conquest is uh, an important part of the propaganda strategy. Um, and Laura Eastlake talks very well about this in her book about masculinity in ancient Rome in the Victorian cultural imagination. Um, but if you just look at the um, this statue, he's this magnificent specimen. Uh, specimen. Um, and Napoleon didn't really look like that. And when he finally saw the statue, it was commissioned when he was um, younger in 1802, um, before his defeat at Waterloo. And when he saw it, he rejected it as too athletic, possibly because he was embarrassed by how little it reflected his kind of um, portly stature. 
Um, so you can see a contrast between the two. I can hear a real weird looping, so I hope you can hear me and it's not too bad. Um, so this, is it okay for you guys? Hello? That's better if you can still hear me. I can't hear it's the looping, but it's our fault. Yeah. Right, marvellous. Um, so Eastlake talks about the, the irony of this kind of egotistical um, self-portrait that he commissioned um, being doubly symbolic because it then fell into the hands of Wellington. Um, so not only did it represent the last laugh for British, uh, for Britain and her allies against Napoleon, because his friends used to hang their umbrellas on its arm, which I just think is brilliant. And I've put this picture of it being hoovered to kind of show that hubris. Um, but it also, she argues, symbolised a partial yet crucial reclamation of Roman imagery for the British manliness after many years of the Napoleonic propaganda machine using it. So re reclaiming this sense of Britishness and British identity and British empire and British context and conquest. Um, and so Carter returns to the metaphor of the statue um, on page 60, where she talks about how Lee has become as silent and decorative as the statue with which she'd always compared him. And if we now understand that this statue represents hubris, um, it gives us a very, um, you know, it underpins that um, the way in which Angela Carter is writing about the power dynamics in the relationship between Annabelle and Lee in love. And then if we move on to the magic toy shop, um, uh, and I'm thinking specifically of the scene in which um, Melanie and Finn go to the Pleasure Gardens and see the fallen statue of Queen Victoria. Um, obviously, Queen Victoria represents this collapse. Sorry, there's a phone that I haven't silenced because it's my old phone and I've got a new phone. I'll throw it away over there. Um, so basically, um, you know, this this newfound, you know, masculine um, uh imagery of Roman gods or, or statues and empire that we looked at in love has now become, um, you know, desecrated in the fallen statue of Queen Victorian in the Magic Toy Shop. And Sarah Gamble argues that the whole book can be read as a metaphor for the condition of England in, in the post-war period. Um, and she um, demonstrates that there's a, a kind of correlation between um, uh, the Pleasure Gardens and the Great Exhibition of 1851, and in turn the Festival of, Brit of Britain, where there was a kind of a attempt to realign British values post-war with the values um, of Victorian um, kind of conquest and so on. And I'm going to argue that um, the this passage in um, the Magic Toy Shop is like one of the most explicit um, passages in which that kind of uh, anti-colonial um, global perspective that Natsumi was talking about in her pa paper is kind of brought to the fore through these images of these fallen statues. So we see the um, the lioness, the carved eyeballs um, with the uncanny blindness of statues who always seem to be perceiving another dimension. And Patricia Juliana Smith argues um, obviously that the lioness represents a very antedated symbol of Britain and its colonies, which Carter is debunking here. And so the Crystal Palace, um, obviously it was first set up in Hyde Park um, during the Great Exhibition, but it was dismantled and moved to South London where Angela Carter lived. Um, and it survived until 1936 when it um, was um, brought down in a, in a huge fire, which you can see in the top corner there. And you can see some of the destruction of that afterwards. Um, but I think these images of statues are, are very prevalent in this kind of pleasure garden in the magic toy shop where we see these ruined statues. Um, and I just wanted to have some imagery of actual statues that were inside the original um, uh, great exhibition. Um, and there's an amazing website there which you can look at um, if you Google um, Sydenham Town Hall um, and statues inside the Crystal Palace. Um, and I just love uh, these images of men looking at nudes, um, female nudes and, and how they operate. Um, and I'm going to just whiz over to heroes and villains now because we've got this fabulous quote um, when we're describing the kind of gothic house um, and at the end there, the bit I've highlighted, upon the balustrade of this terrace were many pocked and armless statues in robes or nude and garlanded. These looked like the petrified survivors of a malign fet champ, um, champetre 
I don't know how to pronounce it. You have to correct me, Martine. Um, and ended long ago in a in catastrophe. And I just kind of looked up some sort of artistic imagery around this, and it's just like a trope in um, sort of pastoral painting um, that goes, you know, from the 17th uh, through the 18th to the 19th century. Um, and all of these have statues doing various things, um, and you can really get a sense of. Um, the sense of, of ruin and decay and debauchery that's um, that Angela Carter is alluding to there. And I just wanted to bring it back to the adaptation of the Magic Toy Shop. And you see from the screenplay here um, that in the screenplay, Finn um, talks about the wood. Well, the, the description says the wood is full of statues, dryads, nymphs, Egyptian figures, Victorian philanthropists, any and every kind of statue overgrown with moss, ivy, lichen, standing among the brambles. And Finn says, a hundred years ago, the Queen of England threw a big party and everyone who was still there at Cockcrow turned into stone. So this idea of this kind of ossified um, party, I think, um, links back to that image that we see from heroes and villains and he goes on to describe um uh the the fallen statue of queen victoria as the queen of the wasteland which is obviously an allusion to Eliot's poem there and melanie talks about her as a fallen woman poor thing um so this big powerful figure of empire is brought low and talked about um uh directly in the screenplay back to the book finn is talking about um uh, we hear we uh, Melanie talks about his queen um, at the end of the low pillared barrier at the front of the dancing floors a rococo stone plinth, um, and then we see um, the vandalism on the plinth where written in lipstick it says the motto Gordon Cox has a fucking great penis, and Finn apologises. I'm sorry about that. Vandals must have done it. So we can see that Carter is desecrating the image of um, Victoria and the Empire even more. Um, and then we have the description of the fallen statue. And so in the book, the statue has fallen sideways, a tall figure which now lay face down in a puddle, narcissistically gazing at itself. So we get that really strong image um, of the uh, uh, from the Greek mythology there. The figure had snapped in two at the waist and was prone at right angles to itself. Slime and fungus streaked it, but it remained recognisably, unmistakably Queen Victoria in young middle age. And we have in the novel Finn describing the statues in a kind of anthropomorphic way. All these gardens were filled with statues, dryads, slave girls, busts of great men, great men on horseback and on foot, handsome yet sylvan prospect where you could promenade to the music of brass bands and they've managed to sell some of the statues. I can't think who'd want to buy them, but the rest of the statues stay because they can't bear to go away. So he's giving them a kind of a human um identity there and in the film that's expressed through a single tear being seen running down queen victoria's face which i've done a big arrow because i'm hoping that the sound works on this um can you tell me if the sound isn't working and um we will see the scene from the film <laughs> years ago, the Queen of England threw a big party, and everyone who was still there at Cockcrow turned to stone. She's the queen of the wasteland.
She's a fallen woman. Poor thing. Um, I hope you were able to to see that it's a very poor reproduction because I haven't been able to get hold of a clean copy. Um, so uh, the obviously the statue um, is uh, very much being debunked in that sense of aggrandizement and um, the whole Victorian project is being debunked here. And although this is very much inspired by Carter's association with South London, we could also argue that um, there is a very prominent uh, statue of Queen Victoria in Bristol and it could have also influenced her while she was writing the novel Living in Bristol. And just moving towards um, bringing this into the prescience and the temporary and the contemporary. Um, so in 1963, which could have informed the writing of this novel, in Canada, in Quebec, um, a statue of Queen Victoria was exploded and her head um, came off. And um, because there was very strong feeling against Victoria Day, um, which um, is celebrated in Canada. And um, that chimes very much with what Sarah Gamble talks about in uh, Carter's um, despising Empire Day when she was at school and she had to dress up in, in the Union Jack and stuff like that. And um, I've just got an example of the Queen Victoria statue in Queen um, in, in College Green being desecrated by having a traffic cone put on her head. And linking that back into what Marie said about um, the Colston statue and how statuary is becoming um, controversial in the sense of is that the best way to celebrate people and um, also, it shows that it's not that new tearing statues down. It's kind of an ongoing project that's happening. It's a way that people can take action uh, against things in a very direct way. Um, so I just think what Carter's doing, and she's, she's doing the same thing in her writing. She's desecrating this figure of Victorian imperialism very powerfully. Um, and then bringing it back to the conversation um, that Marie initiated about this way that we're commemorating Carter, who didn't believe in commemorating. She talked about the, the posthumous fame is no comfort at all. Um, and, you know, yet we had the very screen at um, Marie's um, exhibition that was on display during Car Angela Carter's funeral, um, again made by Corinna Sargood, and it's so beautiful. And the story behind it, um, if you don't know, is about her, her, her one object she wanted to take on her desert island discs, and obviously the plaque that's on her London home. Um, and then in Bristol, we've got her in a kind of a list of people that are celebrated for having an association with Clifton and Hotwells there. Um, and I just want to end this on um, talking about, you know what is the ethics of trying to memorialize somebody that didn't believe in being memorialized and i really love this quotation and i just wanted to end on this written in 83 when she's in her 40s talking about herself in her 30s um 10 years ago i'd have said that i myself wanted to write stories that could be read by guttering candlelight in the ruins of our cities and still give pleasure still have meaning and perhaps i still think like that and i think that's a very moving uh, thing to end on just thinking about people who, who whose cities are in ruins at the moment with the current political situation. Um, I have got a few things to say about the Angela Carter Society but I can leave that to the end of the panel if there's time. Thank you very much. Thanks, um, and then the next speaker is Dr Caleb Subia. Yeah, you introduce them? Um, yeah. I don't know who you introduced everyone, I can't remember. So. <laughs> okay, so our second speaker is Dr. Caleb Silver, who is a senior lecturer at the University of the West of England, Bristol. He uh, also sits on the executive committee of the Angela Carter Society. Dr. Silver has published extensively on Angela Carter. His most recent publication is an edited volume entitled Ludis and Laughter as Feminist Aesthetic, Angela Carter at Play. And the title of Dr. Sivius' paper is Angela Carter's Ecocentric Eco Criticism Explorations. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, there we go. <laughs> okay. Thanks, Caleb. All right, let me see if I can uh, share my PowerPoint. Oh, 
All right. Yeah. Want to see that okay? Yeah. All right. Yeah, so I mean, it's uh, it's difficult to follow that um, impressive uh, duo of uh, Marie and Charlotte. It's a really interesting uh, talk, and uh, I'd love to to hear more about uh, about what you've just been speaking. But um, going to shift the focus slightly on to thinking about Angela Carter as an eco-critical writer. Um, but I have to kind of acknowledge at the beginning that this is the I'm at the very beginning stages of a brand new project. So um, I've only been working on this for a couple of months now, um, but this is this is my kind of latest uh, project that I'm working on, and I'm going to be rereading Carter's body of work through the lens of environmentalism and um, eco criticism. So, just to kind of kick things off, so one of the more kind of famous and more recent books about climate fiction, environmental fiction, one that some of you might be familiar with is Amitav Ghosh's The Great Derangement. And in this book, he charges what he calls serious literary fiction, sort of the traditional novel, with staying silent about climate change and environmental issues. But my colleague Mark Bold recently published a book called The Anthropocene Unconscious, in which he argues that what Ghosh calls serious literary fiction is not really silent about climate change. What he finds is actually expressive aphasia, as he puts it. He says that serious literary fiction is actually teeming with tongue tied questions about climate change and the Anthropocene. And therefore he asks, what happens when we stop assuming that the text is not about the anthropogenic biosphere crises engulfing us now? What if all stories we tell are stories about the Anthropocene? What if all stories we tell are stories about climate change? And I remember hearing Mark uh, talk about his book at a book launch um, late last year and thinking, what if Carter's stories were also about the Anthropocene or about climate change? And so I started thinking more and more about reading Carter through the lens of eco-criticism and thinking about the way in which perhaps Carter was prescient in writing about something that would become an even greater issue for us now, the climate change, the climate catastrophe. Now, a few writers, particularly recently, have been rereading Carter in a very different way. Uh, a few uh, particular scholars, such as uh, Yutaka Okuhata, have been thinking about Carter as not just a magical realist, not just a writer of modern adult fairy tales, as we often like to refer to her, but as a writer deeply interested in the historical situation in which she found herself. Okuhata reads Carter's literary texts as a critique of the political and historical events of the 20th century and with a strong emphasis on mortality. So many of Carter's texts are read as in some sense a commentary on or an exploration of 20th century issues such as warfare, such as the Cold War, the Vietnam War and of course the recent uh, two wars, um, which obviously we find traces of in many of Carter's texts, particularly the early ones. In addition to this, obviously, in the last few years, we've had um, a number of really interesting kind of biographical texts that have provided us with invaluable accounts of Carter's engagement with political issues. So both Edmund Gordon's biography and more recently, uh, Stephen Hunt's excellent book, Angela Carter's Provincial Bohemia, unpack some of the ways in which Carter engaged with particular kind of political issues of her day, including most famously, uh, the CND protests of which she participated in. And therefore, with all of this in mind, my aim for the next few years in putting together this project is to read Carter's literary texts and the essays that she wrote as a body of work that speaks about these kinds of issues of the 20th and now 21st century, and particular environmental issues, climate breakdown, human-made catastrophe, prospect of nuclear war, but also more hopefully about the possibility of alternative ways of life 
and other forms, other forms of life. So the project will involve a number of different aspects. One of them will be looking at the way that Carter writes about particular environments, both so-called natural environments and human-made environments, and look at the connections that she draws between these environments. I'm going to say a bit more about that um, in a few minutes' time. Another aspect will be the way in which Carter tries to gesture to or to embody or to represent um, non-human life forms. How does she write about animals? How does she write about the natural world? And part of this will also be about the way in which she challenges many of the assumptions um, about our conceptions of what it is to be human, what it is to be an animal, and indeed that sort of um, famous and sort of operative opposition between the human and animal that we find in Western philosophy and culture. I'm also going to be looking at the way in which her writings explore ideas of collapse and catastrophe. Think about the number of novels that show us scenes of a post-apocalyptic nature like heroes and villains, or think about some of the catastrophes that take place in, in texts like The Infernal Design Machines of Dr. Hoffman. Clearly, she was a writer very interested in uh, various forms of environmental collapse, and we see that throughout many of her texts. In a very broad sense, I want to think about how her writing tries to tackle what we now refer to as the idea of the Anthropocene, the idea that there is a period in the Earth's history where human beings have had a profound influence um, upon the environment and upon other forms of life. And this will involve thinking about how Carter's writing traces various links between things like capitalism, colonialism, patriarchy, and of course, more specific things like the invention of nuclear power. And finally, thinking about the way in which um, eco-criticism and environmental writing often privileges ideas that are drawn on from the Romantic period. I want to think about Carter as, um, as a writer who is interested in, but also able to bring a kind of critique to romanticist ecological models and perspectives. And we can see this um, as some of the papers earlier today have, have outlined. We can see this in texts um, like The Passion of New Eve, but also in short stories like The Earl King, where we can see uh, rom romantic tropes uh, being used and perhaps problematized in interesting ways. But I want to give um, at least a couple of examples of the kind of work that I'm going to be doing uh, rather than just sketch out the project. And I want to begin um, by thinking a little bit about the two uh, environments that we find in The Passion of New Eve. And it was wonderful to hear some of the, the other papers earlier that, that made mention of The Passion of New Eve. Um, so it'll be interesting to see, uh, I'd be very grateful to hear what those speakers have to, to say about my thoughts on, on the representation of environment in this novel. But the two environments that I want to focus on that I think are the sort of the most obvious ones and that provide an interesting contrast in the novel are the environments of the city of New York, where Evelyn um, initially arrives when he flies over to America, and then the desert in which he in which he flees. So when Evelyn first arrives in the city, it's interesting that Carter highlights uh, three particular aspects of the city. So the first few things that Evelyn notices. Uh, include, first of all, a giant plaster mouth, which leads him to the reflection that this is the country where mouth is king. I think hinting not just at the, con the consumption of food, but also at consumerism more generally. You also notice uh, big bulbous rats gnawing at a heap of garbage, suggesting images of waste, but also of animals taking over or taking back the space that um, has become the humanized city. Excuse me. And he also notices um, a black man running down the street with blood gushing from his throat, suggesting uh, that this is a place of violence, that perhaps animal instincts have taken over, that there is some kind of conflict. And of course, that's expanded on in the novel later on, where we see America fall into a new kind of civil war with different factions uh, fighting one another. And amidst this particularly interesting depiction of urban life, we then see out a relation, we then see a relationship play out between Evelyn and 
and Layla, Lila. And this is characterized as a very predatory relationship. And Evelyn refers to Lila on multiple occasions using the language of animality. So he refers to her um, as a little fox at one point or a creature of the undergrowth. So it's interesting that this dehumanizing animal like language that Evelyn uses to depict Layla takes place within this particular uh, city environment where things are falling apart. More interestingly, though, is the fact that when Layla gets pregnant, as we all know, Evelyn encourages, if not coerces her into getting an abortion. And this unfortunately leaves her sterile. And what makes this more interesting is the fact that then um, Evelyn abandons Layla and flees into the desert. And he characterizes this, uh, the desert as the abode of enforced sterility, the dehydrated sea of infertility, the postmenopausal part of the earth. So it's interesting that there's a, a reflection here, a kind of mirroring between, between Layla and Evelyn's situation uh, and the particular environment in which he's fleeing into, out of the city and into the desert. As Aidan Tynan puts it in his recent book, The Desert in Modern Literature and Philosophy, it is as if Evelyn is fleeing the city, but also fleeing reproductive life itself. And there's a kind of irony, as we probably know, anyone who's familiar with the novel knows that what's about to come up is that Evelyn is about to be captured by mother, the fertility goddess, turned into a woman and impregnated uh, with his own semen. So initially in the book, we get this really interesting opposition that takes place uh, in America, which makes sense um, given that America has often been seen as a kind of new paradise or a paradise regained. The figure of the new, the American Adam is a very prominent figure in American literature. So Carter is very self-consciously setting her novel within this particular kind of space, the, the America of this new Eden, and Evelyn will be transformed into a new Eve. And this obviously grounds the idea of gender in particular kind of naturalizing metaphors and even sacred metaphors, the garden, but not, not just any garden, the Garden of Eden. So yes, as we heard earlier in the really um, interesting description of, of Beulah and, and Mother's particular uh, band of eco-feminists. So Beulah is architecturally structured like a womb under the desert. We've, we've heard from that um, in one of the earlier papers. And Mother's plan uh, clearly rests on what we would call now essentialist and eco-feminist notions of womanhood and nature, the idea uh, that woman is uh, akin to nature. Obviously, we get this in lots of metaphors like uh, Mother Nature and so on. Obviously, Carter parodies this perspective through exuberant or ludic uses of mythic figures and feminine cliches. So she sort of overloads her prose with lots of kind of invocations of goddesses and so on. And I'm sure we're all familiar with this quotation from the Sardian woman where Carter writes that mythic versions of women from the myth of the redeeming purity of the virgin to that of the healing reconciling mother are consolatory nonsenses. So we know from Carter's nonfiction that she had very strong views about this way of depicting gender and particularly depicting uh, womanhood or femininity as something natural. Carter also problematizes this uh, linkage between womanhood and nature. Um, uh, she also uh, does something very interesting this, with this. So as again, we heard earlier in one of the papers about the passion of New Eve, um, mother subjects Eve to a number of interesting images and videos, what we might call kind of brainwashing or social conditioning in order to sort of train her mind to think essentially like a woman. We then obviously learn that Eve manages to escape mother, but is captured um, by Zero, who we, we heard about from uh, from Marie just now, this kind of Charles Manson like figure, kind of impotent, uh, obsessive kind of patriarch. And all of these experiences that Eve un undergoes, um, they highlight the fact that her femininity is something that's acquired rather than something that's innate. She has to kind of be taught how to be a woman. Eve even refers to uh, being captured by Zero as a series of lessons in femininity. And of course, there's Tristessa, who's also hiding out in the desert. It's interesting that Mother, Zero and Tristessa all live in the desert. So Carter is doing very interesting things here with that particular topology. And Tristessa, as we know, is revealed not as this 
sort of essential female Hollywood goddess, but actually is a male transvestite. All of these different aspects of the novel suggest um, that womanhood is in some sense decoupled from nature. Carter essentially is an iconoclast, as we just heard from Marie and Charlotte. She smashes these images, these icons of femininity. And it's interesting that they take place in the desert, given that the desert is um, seen in Western culture and religion as this place of metamorphosis, this place of testing and trial. But if all of this is essentially a series of metaphors or allegories about femininity, about America, about Hollywood, about images of femininity and the reality behind them. I also want to think about and analyze Carter's text in terms of its representation of the desert as a particular kind of space. And I want to think of it through the lens of eco-criticism and thereby uh, spend some time thinking about how this is not just a metaphorical space, but an actual living space and how in some ways the novel is gesturing beyond these, these images of femininity, these images of nature towards something other, something outside of the kind of Western anthropocentric um, perspective. So for example, early on when Evelyn flees the city into the desert, he offers this particular description of that particular space. He writes that the desert is an insane landscape of pale rock, honeycombed peak upon peak in unstable erratic structures, calcified assemblages of whiteness and silence, where jostling pebbles mark the paths of rivers that dried up before time began, where snakes and lizards rustled in the grey sand, where buzzards floated in the sky. So even from just this short extract, we can see how Carter is emphasizing lots of those qualities that we might say problematize the idea of an anthropocentric worldview. We're coming up against whiteness and silence, but we're also coming up against a different kind of temporality. Right? Those paths of rivers that dried up before time began suggest a different kind of temporality, a non-anthropocentric one. And of course, more obviously, we get references to non-human forms of, of animality of, of, of life. It's also interesting, just a page later, that this particular space seems to affect Evelyn in a very profound way. And if we notice with this second quotation here, it's as if Evelyn is being transformed into an animal or perhaps discovering some animality within him pre-existing. So he tells us that I felt I was a tender grub lodged in a crack of inhospitable soil with only my little shell of thin metal, my car to protect me. The silence, he says, stuffed my ears with fur. So it's fascinating how he's fl he's fled the city, this place of corruption, consumerism, illusion, only to find himself in this other space, an inhospitable space in which he becomes essentially a kind of animal. It's almost kind of Kafkaesque in a certain way, where he's sort of turning into a grub with a shell. And as we heard from one of the papers earlier, this is also very similar um, to the experience in the cave at the end of the novel, that cave that is in some sense a mirroring of Beulah, another womb-like space. So we read that the amber uh, was undergoing just move out of the way, undergoing a process of reversal in which I and the rock itself were involved. I peered around me and saw rude shapes of bison and huge helm stag scrawled on the walls in faded, faded pigments. Time is running back on itself. Rather than read this necessarily as a kind of experience of rebirth, which might be sort of to play back into mother's kind of mythology and iconography, of, of woman as a kind of natural space synonymous with the natural world. I think what's more interesting here is the suggestion that this is taking us beyond those myths or beyond those images, even if there is a danger here of um, mythologizing kind of so-called primitive man. Nevertheless, there is this idea of time running back on itself, which is quite surreal and strange, defamiliarizing this particular topology and the idea of the sort of anthropocentric view. In a similar way, 
I also want to spend a little bit of time now thinking about how Carter also pursues this kind of non-anthropocentric view in the way that she depicts animals and human encounters with animals. And one of the most important essays that I've come across um, in, in the last couple of months is Mary Pollock's essay uh, published back in 2000 on Angela Carter's animal tales. As she says early on in the essay, the love and war between humans and other animals is an important theme in Carter's work. It is a constant baseline in almost all the fiction she wrote after the Bristol trilogy and some before, as well as in three of her radio plays and in many of her essays. And I'm sure most of you are familiar with her animal tales. We know how important uh, Carter's work is for engaging with the idea of the animal, the non-human. But what Pollock observes, which I largely agree with, is the idea that in general, Carter's work has been read anthropocentrically. One of the most pervasive critical assumptions she says about Carter's work is that her depictions of animals must represent aspects of human life. And she gives examples of essays by Elaine Jordan, Margaret Atwood, who always emphasise the animal as a metaphor of the human. And Carter talks about this in her essays as well, the way wolves are often seen as synonymous with male predators or the kind of Freudian id. So in this way, animals are read anthropocentrically. So we don't get to think of animals as animals. Sorry, one more minute, Steve. Uh, Caleb, is that OK? That's fine, that's fine. So if we have a look at The Tiger's Bride, I know this has come up already, so I'll uh, move over this quickly. We'll notice that Carter spends a lot of time uh, getting us to think about and to feel what it is to be a non-human animal. There's a lot of emphasis here on affect, uh, to use the term that was mentioned earlier in the talk about Sarah Ahmed. We read about the sweet thunderous purr of the, of the tiger, the reverberations of his purring that rock the foundations of the house the walls begin to dance, and the narrator says that she thinks that everything will fall and disintegrate. We also read just after this that his tongue, abrasive as sandpaper, licks off skin after skin of her life in the world. And obviously she's referring here to uh, the patriarchal world in which she's an object exchanged between her father and, and the tiger. And as Kimberly Lau suggests in her book, Erotic Infidelities, rather than just read this as a metaphor, rather than read the beast, the tiger, as an allegory, as a fable, we can actually read it literally. So he's literally uh, stripping down the layers of a human life in the world and trying to imagine something outside, outside the symbolic order, outside the Western conception of um, animality and humanity. It's also interesting just quickly um, to notice that anim uh, animals appear in lots of Carter's essays, particularly those that she wrote for the New Society back in the 1970s. So in essays like Little Lamb Get Lost, she talks about the way in which uh, living in Japan was very refreshing for the way in which um, animals were not seen in a particularly anthropocentric way. And she also reflects on how our particular Christian culture has often changed the way we think about animals such as snakes. She also reflects on David Attenborough's Life on Earth BBC documentary and the way in which it romanticized the narrative of evolution, but also couldn't help but channel the particularly functionalist ideas of her time. So she notes the various mercantile anthropomorphic metaphors that occur um, throughout the documentary plants advertising their rewards on offer, for example. And finally, just to give one more example, in that same essay, Little Lamb Get Lost, she also notes how there's a, a particular similarity in the way that humans treat animals from the way uh, that men treat women or the way that colonial powers uh, treat their colonial subjects, the way in which dominance is the sort of main characteristic of the relationship between, uh, between humans and animals. And I think implicit here, is a suggestion that perhaps we need a new relationship to both the earth and to other species, not one of dominance, but of mutuality as we see in the tiger's bride. And Carter suggests, like Simone de Beauvoir writing about gender and sex, that this idea of this particular conception of, of animality, of, of beasts, is acquired, not inborn, and so therefore it can be changed. 
So this is just a kind of taster of the project that I'm working on. There's a lot more to say about Carter and eco-criticism, and I'll be looking at a number of other aspects um, of her work that relate to this, including her depiction of post-apocalyptic environments, her critique of the so-called state of nature, her critique of romanticism, and her meditations on those linkages between capitalism, colonialism, and environmental collapse that we see in texts like The Design Machines of Dr. Hoffman. Anyway, thank you for listening to this sort of early outline of my project. I'd love to hear your thoughts on this, and I hope to share more of this work in the future. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Caleb. Thanks, Caleb. Um, next, the last speaker on this panel is Dr. Stephen Hunt, um, who is again at the University of the West of England, Bristol. Dr. Hunt sits on the uh, Executive Committee of the Angela Carter Society and is a member of the Association for the Study of Literature and the Environment. His publications include a volume entitled Angela Carter's Provincial Bohemia, the Counterculture in the 1960s and 1970s Bristol and Bath, which was published, if I'm correct, in 2020. The title of Dr. Hunt's paper is Mapping Year One, Finding Angela Carter in the West Country. Thank you. OK, thank you. Can you see my slides? Yes. Can we, we, we ask you to put it on slideshow, Stephen? Um, it, is that possible? It, I don't think it is actually. It seemed to be hopping across to the other screen if I do that. Well, I can try. Oh, okay. Um, let me try now. Let's see what it happens. Just, it's just bigger for everyone. So people sitting oh, actually, back can see the text. That, that might be okay, actually. Oh. Yeah. Can you see that? Okay. Is that now? That's worse, unfortunately. Because unless right. you could close that window on the side, but. It's yeah. not going to work, is it? No. Okay. Um, all right. Thanks. Thanks. Good try. Okay. Yeah, no, thank you. Go ahead. Yeah, it's okay. Right. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll get started then. Yeah. But uh, yeah, warm thanks to all the organisers and contributors so far. It's been really enjoyable and stimulating. Um, I'm going to be talking a, a little bit about oral history, so sort of leading on from um, some of the rest of the Angela Carter Society. Um, and I would like to share with you some oral history and mapping work that I've undertaken with Marie and with Charlotte and with Caleb. So we, we created a map, let's move on to the next, uh, and a walking tour based on the short book that I wrote, which you've just mentioned the uh, for the Bristol Radical History Group called the Angela Carter's Provincial Bohemia. So the map features 12 different locations around Clifton and Hotwell's area of Bristol. Those of you who know Bristol, um, and again, it's I suppose I'm touching upon the sort of tension between um, Angela Carter's sort of relationship to to Bristol as a place. So I, I, I think what, while Angela Carter was not a writer from the West Country, certainly in recent years, there have been strong claims that she was a significant writer of the West Country. She wrote five of her nine published novels during her formative years as an author while resident in Clifton, Bristol from 1961 to 1969. And major works, including The Passion of New Eve, The Sadian Woman and the short stories for fireworks and some of the work for the for the bloody chamber while living in Bath during the mid 70s, 73 to 76. So the process of memorialization of Carter's relationship in Bristol in particular has been underway. Um, for example, as Marie's mentioned earlier, um, a major exhibition, a heritage pack, plaque uh, and in Bristol, fashion and the inclusion of a war mural. A war mural. So to complement these ephemeral and static tributes, the Angela Carter Society devised a, a do-it-yourself walking tour as a more dynamic and potentially creative form of ongoing memorialization. The map was intended as an invitation to people in the local community and visitors alike to engage with Carter's legacy and the living history of the 1960s and the 1970s counterculture. It's proved to be an adaptable way to bring together the disparate influences and creative forces that helped to develop the author's radical persona. A more extensive and intensive mapping of Carter's former milieu will enable participants to collaboratively explore the unbounded relationship between the writer and a shifting sense of place, unleashing the ongoing of discovery of fresh connections. 
Furthermore, in the case of Angela Carter, who inhabited Clifton within living memory, the act of following her footsteps leads directly to opportunities for remembrances and fresh revolutions through oral histories. This has taken the form of talking to those who either knew her directly or who formerly shared the urban and cultural environment of her milieu in the 1960s uh, Bristol and 1970s Bath. So it was here that she became a successful writer while living in Clifton. And I think that was because she was an adept scholar, a reader and a thinker, um, but also a folk musician, an eavesdropper and a people watcher who enjoyed hobnobbing with performance artists, anarchists and poets that she met here. Uh, so, I've, yeah, I would say that the generosity of interviewees and respondents who have been willing to share print and photographic artefacts from that era is leading to a more extensive and intensive mapping of the territory. Um, this is leading to some new outputs from mapping, um, which hopefully will be in, in turn an invitation um, to, to more people from the local community and others to uh, to engage with living history here. So Angela's residence in the West Country coincided with heady decades of the 1960s and 1970s, an era of so powerful and palpable change that she described the late 60s as being like year one. We could speak of the influence of her time in Bristol and Bath in terms of several aspects of this multifaceted writer and thinker. Scholarly and literary Carter developed as a result of her education in English literature at the University of Bristol. In 2017, Marie Mulvey Roberts and Fiona Robertson brought to life artistic Carter through their Bristol exhibition, Strange Worlds, the vision of Angela Carter. Polly Polisuma has researched and recorded musical Carter. Um, so first off, I'd like to, in, in some detail, um, consider political Angela Carter, and then I'll briefly mention performance Angela Carter as well. Um, so in this respect, it's immediately apparent that the reminiscences and oral history can be quite tricky. Here we must somehow reconcile suggestions of an apolitical attitude, events and expressions of intense political awakening and some purported romanticising. I was particularly intrigued by the story that Angela hung out with anarchists in the Barclay Cafe. Um, you should be able to see that on the screen. That's the Barclay Cafe in 1970, um, which is near the University of Bristol. Both Christopher Frayling and Susanna Clapp have reported these friendships directly with conversations with Angela. First, Christopher Frayling's account. She once reminisced that her political formation grew partly from her childhood experiences in South Yorkshire and its coal fields during the war, and partly from conversations with her anarchist friends in Bristol, who would meet at the Barclay Cafe opposite the university. And then Susanna Clapp. Similarly, and in the Barclay Cafe, she chatted to situationists and anarchists. As she sat in her kitchen in April 1991, ten, more, 10 months before she died, Angela said these anarchists had more influence on her uh, than, than anyone else on her politics. So these two recollection, recollections clearly corroborate, corroborate each other. Additional details, however, are limited because neither Christopher Frayling or Susanna Clapp, I don't think will have known Angela during those very early years as a student at the University of Bristol. Um, correct me if I'm, I'm, I'm wrong on that. Um, so it could be a bit of a dead end in the research uh, since it, be, it might have been possible, uh, difficult or impossible to find out more. Furthermore, Neil Curry, her friend and fellow English student during those years and poet of the 20, uh, 2014 collection, some letters never sent that includes a piece promisingly entitled to Ms. Angela Carter, the Barclay Cafe Bristol, was sceptical about her claims. So we have to ask, was Angela a reliable witness of her own political formation? Curry accompany, accompanied her in the Barclay and recognised that the cafe that is in setting for some of the encounters in Angela Carter's first novel, Shadow Dance of 1966, is undoubtedly the Barclay. He wrote to me in 2019 that when she claimed her childhood experiences in the war influenced her, she must have been romanticising. She was hardly out of her babyhood. And I think that's a fair point. Since Angela was born in uh, 1940, she would have been about five years old uh, when the war ended. So whatever her earlier memories, it's unlikely that she would have emerged from the war politically 
in, uh, formed. After childhood, the next important influence on Angela Carter's political development as a young woman was involvement in the campaign for nuclear disarmament, an important political and a cultural movement mobilising around the Aldermaston marches from the late 1950s. In a 1983 essay, Sugar Daddy, Angela memorably recorded her new friendship with Paul Carter. I finally bumped into somebody who would go to Goddard movies with me and on CND marches and even have sexual intercourse with me, although he insisted we should be engaged first. So here Angela's political awakening is, is linked in her mind with her sexual awakening after getting together with her first husband, the cause of her move from London to Bristol in early 1962. Again, Neil Curry's view of that time, that he knew the Carters in the early to mid 60s, was that, and I quote, Paul was the political one, Angela's politics were more emotional than thought through. So this does support the case, however, that her main political development took place during her years while living in Bristol, which is probably unsurprising given the famous political turbulence of the 1960s. So what about these anarchists and situationists in the Barclay Cafe? One of the reasons that I wrote the uh, Angela Carter's Provincial Bohemia uh, was that the West Country counterculture is a relatively small territory and I had some lucky breaks in meeting some of the people who were habituaries of the Barclay Cafe and in part of the anarchist scene during the 1960s. First I met um, Dave Lawton who was part of Angela Carter's circle at this time, sadly at the funeral of Heathcote Williams, an influential figure in the counterculture. More core to the anarchist scene, the serendipity continued as then I reached Angela Carter's uh, friends from the Bristol days and later Dave and Pat Thorne through their nephew and uh, Nick Gilbert. They were members of the Bristol Anarchist group at that time and first met Angela through their mutual friendship with the artist John Orsborne, um, who it's claimed could have been the prototype for Honey Buzzard in, in Shadow Dance. So the Arna Feeney Art Gallery, of which Orsborne was co-founder, hosted a national anarchist a gathering in 1964. So Angela came to be involved with the friendship circle that involved the Thorns. Adam Nicholson, a particular figure of fascination for Angela, uh, according to the Thorns. Another Bristol anarchist, Digger Walsh and Ian Vine. Another probable link was through a mutual friend of Orsborne and the Thorns, a local British, uh, Polish emigre they knew as Fred Shamasco. They strongly suspected that he appeared in Shadow Dance as a minor character, the anarchist called Bruno. So this begs the question, what was the greatest influence that Angela shared with it, with both uh, Suzanne, Susanna Clapp and Christopher Frayling that she attributed to her political formation at this time? On the one hand, there is a distancing from overt political activity. After participating in the Aldermaston marches, uh, what she later called in the 1980s is exhibitions of mass sanity, she doesn't seem to have taken to the streets to join the many political rallies in the 1960s Bristol, although she did attend the fund raising event against the Vietnam War. And I found no comments on two celebrated events in the city, the, the famous Bristol boy, bus boycott of 1963 or the 1968 student occupation at the university. At the end of the 1960s, the city was also at the forefront of the emerging women's liberation movement, with the local group forming around Clifton and Red Redland being one of the earliest of its kind nationally. But Angela does not seem to reference the group so far as I'm aware, although she did share a platform with the revolutionary feminist artist Monica Shu at a later date, and at least shared mutual friends with another founder, Pat Van Twest. Furthermore, her comments Furthermore, her comments in a letter to Carol Roth in 1972, quoted by Gordon, uh, Edmund Gordon, uh, she distances herself from revolutionary activity. My position in any revolution, sexual or otherwise, is always bound to be equivocal because basically I don't want to get involved. On the other hand, Carter asserted strong positions on many of the national and international political issues of a day. So what might she have taken forward from the cafe chats with her anarchist friends? In a 1988 essay, Truly It Felt Like Year One, she shared her memories and reflections on the 1960s. So we took this as the title of the guided map tour because it was where she most explicitly 
recalls her life in Bristol for nearly a decade during the, the swinging 60s. Here she challenged the backlash against the sexual revolution, stereotypical notions of femininity and masculinity, and spoke of her journey to feminism. She had become a fierce critic of colonialism. Here again, she celebrated the end of the Vietnam War as a victory against imperialism and referred to our very own ugly little colonial war in Northern Ireland. She joined the local La Labour Party during her years in Bath. She supported the Greenham Common protests in another essay of the 1980s, Anger in a Black Landscape, where she proclaimed, the only way to stop nations periodically going to war with an one another in this new and morally indefensible way was a concerted impulse towards a federation constructed among along humanitarian and egalitarian lines. Given my particular background and bias, this could only mean one thing, international socialism. So while absent from the barricades, I'm not sure uh, that she actually, actually visited the peace camps either. Angela was supportive to, to radical causes from, be, from behind the scenes and politically not knowledgeable. Ian Bone of Class War, the anarchist group, told me that she even slipped the London anarchist a cheque for £50 in 1985. Her old friend, Pat Thorne, who attended Carter's funeral, said that she was immensely well informed. Whenever you had a political discussion with her, she was absolutely informed on the subject. I mean, long before I'd heard about East Timor, she knew all about it. This political commitment that seems to have been ignited in Bristol was also apparent by the presence of some of the other attendees at Carter's funeral in 1992, which included the socialist Tarek Ali and fellow novelist and friend Salman Rushdie, at that time otherwise keeping a low profile due to the fatwa issued following the publication of the Satanic Verses. So while we have these contrasting and even contested accounts of Angela Carter's views, these I think can partly be explained by the evolving perspectives from the early to mid 1960s and by different political perspectives on the part of the commentators. The evidence largely supports her claim that she was politically radicalised as a consequence of her residence in Bristol. One minute, sorry, Stephen. Oh, OK. Sorry. Maybe um, I was going to talk about performance as well, actually, but maybe maybe we could finish it there and just. Uh, yeah, there's other things that I could talk about, but uh, that would that that feels like quite a good place to stop, actually. Um, and I won't talk about performance in uh, Clifton and Bath. Um, I can just give you my little uh, conclusion. Having mapped the emergence of Angela Carter's radical politics and love of performance while living in Clifton, I would finally like to end by noting that she also penned the words to the children's favourite comic and curious Pat Cats while living in Bath, concluding, I love my cat with an X, Y, Z. There is really nothing more to be said. Thank you. Right, so now we can take questions and then we have lunch. <laughs> um, so if you will put your hands up in the chat um, using the My Reverse icon, uh, and if you want to put your hands up physically in the real world, it's also an option in this room. Um, so I'm just looking for hands that are up in the chat. And there's one here from Sheila. Hello, Sheila. I was just intrigued when you were starting to talk about the performance uh, <laughs> stuff that she did. And as you didn't have time to mention it, I wonder if I could ask you a performance yeah um yeah it was partly her involvement with the performance um group in bristol called the grot club um so we know quite a lot about the uh the carter's activities and the folk scene but there was all this there was also this slightly odd situationist dadoist kind of performance group um mostly run by somebody called bob gale upstairs in the in the lansdowne um uh, pub uh, which was the venue for the folk club and uh, yeah there's this story of uh, Arcel Stein the actor being hung in a straight jacket from upstairs and gradually lowered down um, there's all sorts of stories about um, Angela um, going along to Christmas pantomimes and uh, all these surreal events there so she's very much a part of that that scene and uh, um, I don't think that's really been uh, talked about very much up until now it's the sort of thing that um, 
only really available through oral history, I'd suggest. And then in Bath, um, she became very good friends with Shirley Cameron and Roland Miller, um, involved with the Bath Arts Workshop, and she wrote the script for a play uh, called uh, Transformations and Ceremonies of the Beasts, uh, which was performed in Walpole Village Hall. Um, so quite a lot of information around that. I've been uh, I've been in touch with uh, Shirley Cameron, who's been very very helpful as well. Uh, so that's another area I've been looking forward to looking looking into. Um, thank you. Talk for another day. <laughs> yeah. Um, so the next question is from Marie. Oh hello. Um, I I just wanted to um tell you about a a very important literary statue in Bristol which was decaying and had to be demolished. And this was the, the um, statue of the poet most associated with Bristol. Of course, Carter was writing poetry, initially saw herself as a poet when she was a student in Bristol. And this is the statue of Thomas Chatterton. And um, it, it was um, taken from consecrated ground because of his disreputable reputation and belief that he committed suicide. It was put at uh, Mary Redcliffe. And because of uh, traffic pollution, uh, it, it was um, it was uh, decaying. And what is so interesting about this is that it was demolished in 1967, the year that she started writing the magic, she published the magic toy shop. And I, I just wanted to tie that into what Charlotte was saying about uh, statues in, uh, in, in there. And, and just finally wanted to show you the um, Millennium's new statue of Thomas Chatterton in Bristol, which which I've got a big picture of it here. Can you see that behind me? Um, that's a photograph of of the statue of Thomas Chatterton, and um, I'm, I mean, I'm sure Angela Carter would have known about that statue um, in Bristol. So I just wanted to make that link because I've never made that link myself until I heard Charlotte's paper. So maybe that's something we can include in our chapter, Charlotte, in uh, in in uh, Sarah and Anna's um, uh, uh, book um, on Carter. Yeah. Amazing. Uh, Charlotte, you raise your hand up as well. Thank you. Um, I really enjoyed um, hearing all the other papers in this panel, which we haven't conferred apart from me and Marie. Um, so thank you very much. Um, and Stephen, I was just thinking, um, as somebody who's coming out uh, the other side of having a child who's now a teenager, so he can have a key and come home, um, and she didn't have children, but she may have had other responsibilities that prevented her from engaging with some of those marches and things like that. So I'm just wondering if there's a gendered thing going on there. Maybe that's not a, a good argument. Maybe other women could engage with it, but um, I don't know. And then the other thing was about the war in terms of I do think people have PTSD um, and inherit trauma from from that. And my mum was exactly the same age. She's an April baby in 1940. She remembers the war and when she did a photography course in America and there was a tornado warning she leapt into the dark room because she could remember having to go to the Anderson shelter so they people do remember the war if they were that young and um it was really traumatic and um you know so I just think yeah that was it really but yeah I really enjoyed it and, and Caleb your paper was incredible and I can't wait to see how this project develops um really really exciting to, to hear thank you and um, I'm I can see that there's three more hands up and I'm only going to take two because I'm a horrible control freak. I'm really sorry. So Arawa and Martin, just because we're already technically in the lunch break. So Arawa, do you want to ask your question? Where have you gone? There you are. Um, yes, thank you, first of all, to all the panelists for their fascinating papers. Um, I'll be quick because of time. Um, my question is for Caleb. Um, I found your project very fascinating, and um, and your take on the cave scenes also um, very fascinating in terms like of an unbirth. And I think there's a question in the chat that also mentions that. So um, I read it as a rebirth, but there is an unbirth here in this kind of you know reset. Um, and then you also you also mentioned that. Um, Carter decouples nature, femininity from nature, uh, and I was wondering if you could speak more more about that, and if there are other examples of her work where she kind of subverts, you know, this kind of connection between the feminine and the natural. Yeah, thanks very much. Um, I guess because I'm about to do some teaching on this next week, I do wonder whether Carter was partly inspired by Huxley's Brave New World, 
which again decouples reproductive femininity uh, sorry reproductive life from from womanhood or from femininity and I, I do wonder whether Carter was partly inspired by that in in conceptualizing this this idea for the passion of new Eve um, in terms of the other of Carter's texts um, I mean, I think there are definitely lots of links to be drawn between the Passion of New Eve and other texts that also explore mythologized images of womanhood or of femininity, um, tying woman to nature. Um, but I think the Passion of New Eve is perhaps the, the strongest in some ways. I think because I'm at the beginning of this project, um, I almost haven't done enough kind of reading and, and spent enough time thinking about this. But it's a very good it's a very good question, I think. It's a good question because given the imagery of the Passion of New Eve, it's all too easy to see, for example, the cave scene as this rebirthing scene, as if woman and nature are the same. And I want to try and find a way of kind of reading against the grain um, if that if that will work. But uh, it's, a, it's a very good question. Thanks very much. I'm definitely going to think about that when I'm doing this project. And last question from Martine, please. Yeah. Um, so first of all, thank you so much, Marie and Charlotte and, and Caleb and all. Um, I wonder to what extent we can easily <laughs> co-opt Carter for various causes, which is why I thought that um, uh, adding a question mark to the conference, to the topic of the conference about Carter's uh, uh, radical prescience uh, is, is I think, very important and perhaps important to remember against the grain of um, modern day uh, academia. Uh, I, I, I think that it's very always important to remember Carter's point about self-flattering myth-making, um, which is something that she practiced throughout her life. So it's always very hard to 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 also fix her or even though the temptation is to try and read one particular aspect or passage or scene from her fiction as somehow saying it all i think that it's important to try and maintain a sense of how carter constantly reinvented herself refashioned herself and even looked at herself uh, um, from a critical distance, which sometimes um, uh, critics <laughs> tend to, I don't know, ignore because it's it's uncomfortable to 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 try and emulate this sense of uh, self awareness, critical self awareness. Maybe quickly, I have a question for Marie and Charlotte because I think that the 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 paradox that you are. Um, that you are engaging with, namely how to commemorate an iconoclast, I mean, to quote Marie's own, own words at the beginning, is, is, is very important precisely because it retains a sense of the, of the contradictions that we are all you know, trapped in. Um, but the point that I was, perhaps that I wanted to make is that Carter was no mere, was no nihilist. Uh, and I think that she that it's important to 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 get a sense of her as uh, uh, being extremely well read, uh, self-taught mostly, but not only, uh, never sentimentalizing social movements, uh, even never sentiment sentimentalizing revolution as such. You know, she was able to. Uh, both see the, see the point uh, um, of of social com conflict and and uh, and uh, uh, and all kinds of forms of resistance, but also never you know, leaving it at that either. And so when you mention the word, you know, champêtre, you know, pastoral, I mean, it says a lot about Carter's um, uh, um, intellectual curiosity. So the idea for her is, I think, never simply. Uh, to destroy, you know, to topple down, you know, statues, but to 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 use them, to refer to them, to uh, um, and to you know, Western art and thought and a lot more beyond, 
um, uh, in order to think creatively and critically. So to me, there is a very big difference between uh, destroying statues and, and toppling them down on the one hand and what Carter was actually doing uh, on the other and and how it fashions a particular kind of reading experience for her readers an attitude towards the past. Sorry, I've been blathering on as always, but I don't know if there's something you'd like to, I don't know, challenge or, or, or I don't know, respond to. Can I respond or would you like to go first, Marie? I'll just quickly say something. I think that's really helpful, Martin, for us thinking, you know, where do we go next in this argument in terms of, of toppling and, and the significance of them. And just that, just wanted to make a quick point about the uh, the toppling of the Colston statue because it, it was desecrated. It was covered with red paint to symbolise the, you know, the, the blood of the slaves that he had on his hands. And when it was dumped into the river, it was put into the M shed and the curators decided not to clean up the statue, but to leave it as desecrated and damaged. And for that to be the artifact and that to be the context in which people would view it in the museum. And in a sense, what we can say is what Carter's doing in her, through her prose, through her fiction in the same kind of uh, spirit. So, yeah, thank you for that comment. And that, I think um, there is I do walk the tightrope between hagiography and, you know, because I I admire her as a writer and as a human human being. And I've got a similar relationship with Cary Grant um, where I'm trying to bring criticality to it. And so I think that's a really important point um, to to not straightforwardly biographize her and kind of make connections between her biography and her work in the really straightforward way. Um, but I do think that that quotation of looting and rummaging is really useful because it's a playfulness and it's a it's not as you say it's not just destroying for the sake of destruction it's to show that something is constructed and we can construct it anew in a different way and that's that's my main takeaway from Carter and that, that's kind of come through all the papers that we've heard um it's about and, and people do criticise her for kind of just exploding things and then not offer, offering an alternative. And that, that could be a fair criticism and that, that could be something we could think about. But I think that's our responsibility to bring the alternatives. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Great. Thanks, everyone. So um, I'm going to close this panel now and we'll, we're back at 2 p.m. for lunch. So um, again, I would encourage you to have 